He is drawn automatically to reach out to the unhappy people who are suffering with pain and he does what best he can do. The most important thing is that there is no pride in his mind or no sense of ego that I have done something. He is just a natural spontaneous response on his part that when he finds somebody in pain or suffering, he automatically reaches out to them. <clears throat> and the description of this Vaishnava, which Narasimha has given, is very similar to this Tritaparajna description we find in Bhagavad Gita. More clear, in fact. Moha maya vyape nahi One who is not overpowered by delusion and, and maya, the moha, the unhappy uh, aviveka and maya, the delusion, one who is not overcome, meaning that one who sees through that. Dhradava yaragya jana manumare and one who is dhradava yaragya, a dispassion, a firm dispassion, unswerving vairagya or unswerving dispassion he has. Meaning that his mind doesn't get tempted at all, doesn't get attracted to any kind of pleasures which he knows very well are nothing but mere appearances with no content in them. So that is called maya, which creates an appearance of what is not there. And the, the objects and achievements of the world create the appearance of happiness, which in fact they do not contain. And therefore, he sees through this, and therefore he is not tempted at all. This is important because then alone your mind can be steady. The mind can be unswerving, mind can be steady, mind can be abiding only when it is not tempted or attracted by this false appearance of pleasure. Because he always abides in Ishvara or abides in his own self. Rama Nama Sutayaragi Sakala Tirat Tanatanvari. All the tirtha, all the holy places are in his body. And therefore, having darshan of a saint like that, having darshan of all the tirtha, all the holy places. To such an extent that, Nasimata says that, even to have darshan of a saint like that, you get liberated along with 71 generations up and down, they get all liberated just by the darshan of a saint like that. So very beautiful, as very well known, very dear to Mahatma Gandhi and sung by various artists and chose the same very beautiful thank you. So with that we can open now the forum for any questions. Swamiji, in the same bhajan there was one line Jihva Thakke Asatyana Bole Jihva Thakke Asatyana Bole Paradhana Navajale Hathare Jiva means tongue, who never utters a word of untruth. Asatya. Asatya never comes out of him. He dwells and he lives and abides in truth. Then in the case, any word of fallacy never comes out of him. Paradhanam Namajare Hathare, who is never tempted by the wealth that belongs to somebody else. Parasthi Jane Mahatare, for whom all women are like his mother. <coughs> Mm -hmm. None of us are very fortunate here in North America that we have so much that we can give. Um, what do you think, like, you know, there's a, there's, there's no, I guess, uh, like, what is a good amount that we should at least strive to give? Different traditions give different percentage, you know, of their income. Yeah. 
But 10% is a well-known percentage, you know, hmm. of your income that you can you know, share with others. Because more than that we will feel insecure. <laughs> we will, you know, what will happen to us if we give her too much? That in the case, this is usually the percentage that is told by these, you know, by the teachers. But whatever you can give, you know. Uh, dhanam, a charity, is considerably one of the very best uh, means of purification of heart and purification of wealth also. Because whatever comes to us comes with its blemishes. So wealth that also comes to us does bring some blemishes with it because it is likely that in the process of our acquiring wealth somebody may be hurt or this person who is giving us wealth also may have acquired it through not very fair means. And so in every activity Lord Krishna says that just as smoke is associated with every fire, so also some blemish is associated with every action. And then in the case, what we eat also contains blemishes, what we earn also contains blemishes, and never all of these need to be purified. So dhanam is one way of purifying our wealth. We do experience uh, Moha and Maya, mm -hmm. and yet it's uh, very difficult <laughs> to get out of this. <laughs> well, I guess what you mean by Moha and Maya is attachment towards children, attachment towards our near, the close family, and uh, concern for them, which is all right. As long as this is done out of love, as long as your concern is for their well-being, that you do not personally expect any kind of return out of that, love always will express itself in terms of concern. So that is all right if you have that. Uh, we have to watch out. So we don't have a personal agenda in terms of when we are concerned about them. It is true, of course, we are concerned about our own child and not any other child. Suddenly, there is a partiality in all that. <clears throat> but still, the family life is an excellent uh, setup for cultivating love and kindness and concern. So if you can practice even among those few people who are close to you, it itself is a great uh, achievement that you have selfless love for them. Make your love or concern as selfless as you can. And that is purifying the heart. So it's quite all right. That's why Ishwara has created this setup called the family. So that we have that uh, automatically our heart reaches out to those who are close to us our blood relationships. But then also try to make that relationship as free from selfishness or demands or expectations as possible. When do you know we have expectation? When you get disappointed. When someone near and dear to us disappoints us, then we know that some expectation was there. So sometimes while expressing love we may not know, but from the result we know, then we learn, we learn, and then learn as to how as human beings we have our own insecurities, our own needs are there, and how therefore those insecurities and needs also can express in the love and concern for the nearest ones also. We will learn about ourselves and grow. <coughs> Swamiji, uh, between selfless love and duty, which one should supersede? They need not be, they, they are not necessarily different from each other. Selfless love and duty. What is meant by duty is what I am required to do. 
general duty is called kartavya in Sanskrit. Kartavya means that which should be done, which has to be done. But if that very duty or kartavya, what you are required to do, what you are obliged to do, let us say, duty is sometimes translated as obligatory duty, that there is a, you are obliged to do. But that very duty itself can be made a uh, occasion for expressing selfless love. Because duty means that you are reaching out to somebody. Duty means that somebody else's need is more important than that of yours. And so that very duty can be performed with love and make the love as selfless as you can. So what is duty after all? Serving somebody, is it not so? Duty towards spouse, duty towards children, duty towards family, duty towards even society. That calls for you to reach out and serve them. So that service can be rendered with love. So, in fact, duty gives us an opportunity to express our love. In that case, duty becomes a great means of our self-growth. If duty is performed because I'm required to do, what can I do ultimately, you know, I'm stuck with this, then it becomes a burden. In fact, if duty is not done in the right spirit, it can also bring out an inner hurt because you feel that somebody is taking advantage of you. You are being exploited. You have to do. And usually we have an expectation of a return of favor. So when I perform my duty and I do not get in return the favor that I expect, then I feel exploited, I feel hurt. So duty is meant for our self-growth. And our Swami teaches that we should turn from being consumers to contributors. So duty is an excellent occasion for being a contributor, that you can contribute. So look upon duty as an opportunity to grow. Grow in your spirit of contribution, grow in your spirit of selfless love. Therefore duty and selfless love need not be Separate. Swamiji, I just wanted to ask you something. Uh, I just got the news yesterday that a 23-year-old guy passed away in our relatives. And compared to my father who led a life, full life, and he passed away at 84. Now 23 and 84, there is a lot of, you can say there's a lot of difference. Now my question to you is, we know that we are all given number of breaths. Each one of us, when we come to this earth, we are given number of breaths. Once they are gone, our role is over. We are finished. But my question to you is, what is the underlying explanation why we are on this earth for this many years or these many years? What decides it? What is the underlying? <coughs> You are on this earth for fulfilling an agenda that you have. The basic agenda that every human being has is to be happy. But happiness can be only gained by making someone else happy. The right way of gaining happiness is by making someone else happy. There are two ways of gaining happiness. A binding way of gaining happiness and a freeing way. So when you gain happiness only for yourself, through objects and things of the world, that's one way of gaining happiness, which is binding. Which in fact makes you dependent. Which makes you uh, attached. And so, second way of gaining happiness is by making someone else happy. So we are born on this earth, number one, to
to gain happiness, unconditional happiness, which is the same as love, and that happiness or love is best gained by making somebody happy, by loving somebody. So you are here to love, to contribute and to grow. What is meant by growth is that uh, there is purification of our heart and therefore happiness manifests on its own. So ideal happiness is that which manifests in our heart without any effort. And that's the purpose of life. And that purpose is accomplished by being a contributor, by offering love, by offering happiness, by offering whatever we have. We have. Like the 23-year-old mother, she's obviously very, very upset right now. So is his father. I'm just asking you, like, they are in that loving mode, but in the binding loving mode, mm -hmm. as you described. Mm -hmm. But what should one think to get beyond that? Well, since we are only witnesses to that event and therefore unconnected, we can be objective about that event. The parents are so close and would have suffered such a big loss cannot be objective. But we can be objective in understanding. Now that twenty-three-year-old young man had come for a certain agenda to contribute something to this world and he has done it and he has continued on his path. We accept the continuity of life. So life does not end merely by the, by the death of the body. Life continues in another environment. It is true that it is no more available to us now. So to us, to those who are now remain left, left, there is a great sense of loss, no doubt about that. And irreparable loss, perhaps, you know, something that can be replaced. And therefore the parents will have to, will suffer. They have to go through that pain of uh, separation. That suffering is caused by their own karmas? Well. Or like it was... It's a combination. It's a combination of their own karma and the karma of this young man who passed away and it's such a combination. But no doubt that whatever happens to us has a reason in terms of the past karma. But when you use this word karma, next question will be, oh, Swami, what have I done to deserve this? Because we do not remember having done any karma to deserve this kind of shock, this kind of punishment. Therefore, I am reluctant to use the word karma, but you are right. That whatever happens has a reason to happen. And that reason is karma, which if not done in this lifetime, and for the past in a lifetime, something we have inherited in this lifetime, which may have brought about this event, a very painful event. And also pain is, is a reality of life. Human life is painful. And pain comes to us in one way or the other. And so we have to accept that pain also is a reality. When there is association, there is separation also. They are all realities. And more maturely we can accept the reality, more we will be able to come out of this, this pain. Question, Swamiji. Um, you were talking about truth. And how wise is it to tell the truth at all times, mm -hmm. even if it hurts somebody? <coughs> should one follow that we should tell the truth regardless whether it hurts somebody, or find a truth that won't hurt somebody? Or it's always a um, dilemma in one's mind that. Should one say the truth even though it hurts somebody? Number one, you are not obliged to say anything. We 
we are not obliged to say anything. The thing is, if we do choose to say something, then it should be truthful. But just because it is truth does not mean that we have to speak about it. You can keep it to yourself. If you think that speaking truth is not going to serve any purpose, then don't speak. <coughs> if you think that speaking truth will serve a purpose, will benefit somebody, then do speak. The rule about speaking truth is Satyam Bruyat, Priyam Bruyat. We are told that speak truth and speak in a pleasant manner. Na Bruyat, Satyam Priyam. If truth also is not pleasant, then better do not speak that. Priyam api na anukam na bruyat. Just because something is pleasant doesn't mean that you will say if it is false. So ideally one should speak truth in a pleasant manner, so that it does not hurt other person. But if you feel that speaking truth is important for the well-being of the other person, if your intention is very clear that you are speaking truth for the well-being of the other person, then you may speak. And try to speak that as pleasantly as you can. But it may not always be possible. But speak truth if necessary and if it is beneficial to someone. Yes? The other side of the coin. Mm. How do you explain? Asvetama Ataha Indira. You see, this is a, what he is saying is a, a very uh, famous event in the, in the in battle of Mahabharata on the part of Yudhishthira who was obliged to tell a white lie. And so Dronacharya was invincible. After Bhishma fell, then Dronacharya became the commander and chief of the Kauravas and he was then invincible. It looked like he would destroy the whole Pandava army. And so Lord Krishna says that he has to go. The thing is that the death of all these big warriors was already destined in a certain way. And Dronacharya had taken a vow that I will, I will not hold weapons moment my son dies. He was so much attached to his son Ashwatthama that he had taken a vow that moment Ashwatthama dies, I'll just drop all my weapons. And Lord Krishna knew this. And so Ashwatthama, of course, was the name of the son of Dronacharya. Ashwatthama also happened to the name of an elephant. So Lord Krishna says to Arjuna, hey, kill Ashwatthama. I can't kill Ashwatthama, I don't find him. He says, no, that elephant is Ashwatthama, kill him. <laughs> and now announce Ashwatthama Hataha, Ashwatthama Hataha. So Bhim said, no hesitation, he announced Ashwatthama Hataha, Ashwatthama, meaning that Ashwatthama is killed, Ashwatthama is killed. Dhrunatha says, I don't believe him, sir. When Yudhishthira says that, then I will accept, believe it. So Lord Krishna says, come on, you say, Ashwatthama this. I won't say. Well, I know Ashwatthama is not killed. No, Ashwatthama, the elephant is killed. Elephant is killed, Ashwatthama, the man is not killed. So I won't say. But Lord Krishna persuaded Yudhishthira to say yes. Because it's a white lie. He is killed and still not killed, you know. So, he announced Ashwatthama Hataha. He qualified his statement saying, Narova Kunjarova. Nara means human being, Kunjara means an elephant. So Narova, whether he was human being or elephant, I can't say. But Ashwatthama is good. So this white lie was told supposedly for the larger good. So truth is not truth if it brings about damage. And untruth is not untruth if it brings about a benefit. So by that definition, what Yudhishthira said also can be called truth because 
is brought about a larger good in terms of uh, uh, that the, pan, the Kaurava army ultimately was destroyed because Kaurava stood for a dharma. So it was ultimately the death of a dharma. <coughs> Sometimes the question is asked, how do you say that Pandavas are on the side of dharma and Kauravas are on the side of dharma? Because Kauravas are great dharmic people like Bhishma, Pitama, who was very dharma, even Dronacharya also. How do you say that Kauravas stand for dharma? The answer is, who is the leader? Who is the leader of Pandavas? Yudhishthira, who is the embodiment of dharma. Who is the leader of Kauravas? Duryodhana, embodiment of dharma. And therefore, that army is called the army of dharma. This is the army of dharma. And so Lord Krishna's job is dharma samsthapana arthaya. One of the, ta- one of the important uh, reasons for avatar or incarnation is to re-establish dharma. And here it was necessary that all these kshatriya kings had to die in order for re-establishing dharma. Therefore, Lord Krishna had really destroyed that history during the battle of Mahabharata. Swamiji, once you have Dikshita, then you is it better to chant your mantra from Guru or you can chant any other mantra? How does it Well, the reason why you chose to take Diksha, <coughs> you chose to take Diksha from a certain Guru because you are reverence for that Guru. And if that is so, then it's only proper that you chant the mantra that is given to you by the Guru. That does not mean you cannot chant any other mantra, but primarily, Emphasize this mantra. So when you talk earlier about karma, hmm. when somebody loses a job or a child is sick, which is caused by the negative karma from previous life, is it true that uh, the parents of the puja part or some grav shanti, uh, this thing can help? Yes. The question is now, uh, we have brought with us, inherited or brought with us some negative karmas. So negative karmas can be neutralized by positive karmas. Therefore forms of worship, japa, homa, all of these are the actions which are punya karma, virtuous actions. And they can neutralize the negative actions. So it is quite right to do that. So generally when you go to an astrologer, he tells us uh, what this situation of the graha, the planet is, and what possible uh, difficulty or pain can come in your life. And they also prescribe what kind of mantra you should recite for how many times, for which graha. So that's quite all right. Prayer can, it's definitely useful. So many how do I get beyond emotions and feelings? Why should you be, why should you want to go beyond emotions and feelings anyway? Yeah. I get a little bit more further. Oh, see, here is a story of one sannyasi, one sadhu. In the olden days, when you had to walk to the shrines in the Himalayas. So Badrinath is one of the famous shrines of Himalayas. And this sadhu had visited and had darshan of Badrinath 21 times. While returning, he went for bhiksha, begging his food in the surrounding villages on the way back. And he stood before a house and announced, Bhavati Viksha and the mother please give me Viksha. An old woman came out, saw a sadhu at her doorstep, was very happy, invited sadhu into her house, served him food and ch- chatting. Says, Maharaj Ji, where are you coming from? Then the sadhu says, Mother, I had darshan of Badrinath, 21 times I visited Badrinath. There were tears rolling in the eyes of this old woman. O oh Lord, when will the day come when I will have your darshan, Badinath? 
Sadhu says, Mother, take away the punya of my 21 visits and give me your bhakti. <laughs> The reason I ask is so because as you experience now, I've noticed that whenever I'm singing, there's another part that I don't sing as much, that I get really, I start melting, and it touches my heart. That's why I ask, how can I get beyond that? Why do you want to go beyond that? <laughs> People try their whole life for melting their hearts, you know? I melt a lot. So you are it's a blessed person. It is like this, you know, this uh, Uddhava when was sent to uh, Vrindavan, you know, to teach gopis, meditation and things like that. And he saw one gopi sitting with closed eyes on the bank of Yamuna. And uh, Uddhava uh, addressed her, Hey, what are you doing? Let me show you how to meditate on Lord Krishna. He says, she says, oh, Uddhava, I don't know how to get rid of him from his, my mind, you know. <laughs> you teach me how not to, to remember him. <laughs> so to have a heart which melts by, the, by singing the glory of the Guru or Ishwara is a very blessed heart. So go, continue with that. And important is melting of the heart, not singing. It is voice of Yeah. strike the balance between self-contentment and the ambition. You know, sometimes they contradict. If you become self-content and become less ambitious, or how do you make strife? Ambition and contentment, they are opposed to each other. Ambition is also natural because uh, natural because we want to achieve things. And we want to achieve things this is a problem with human being, ambition. And as human beings, we always compare ourselves with others. And look upon some other people as more successful than we are. And we want to be like them. And so these ambitions arise very often out of a sense of inadequacy, out of a sense of comparing with others, and out of the need to be somebody else. Because there is no acceptance of myself right now, and I want to be somebody else. From there, the ambition comes. So it is there. And you will not be easily able to replace it by contentment. Well, ambition also motivates you to work hard, to achieve things, to make you more productive. In that sense, ambitions have their own role in our life. So manage your, oh, one, what we can say is that manage your ambitions and don't become managed by ambitions. What is meant is manage your ambitions and seek to fulfill them through fair means. And not come in the way of somebody, not trample upon the rights of somebody in the process of your fulfilling your ambition. See that you don't hurt somebody else or deprive them of their rights in process of your fulfilling ambitions, but you may pursue your ambitions. And then again, the second aspect is that you take the responsibility for effort. Do not take the responsibility for the outcome of the effort. What causes stress and what causes pain is not ambition itself, it is a non-fulfillment of ambition. Even that also is not a problem. We may talk about that this evening, but problem is I judge myself as a failure, so that's what is causing all the problems. Stay away from that, that's called attachment to the results. So as long as you stay away from that, ambition is fine, hard work is fine, and enjoy your effort. Enjoy the outcome that comes. It may not always be what you want. So whatever outcome comes, learn to enjoy it. Then ambition is okay.
सभी विषय गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म सुशुदन फ्री टू गुरु और टू गॉड How does one and then there are many gurus. Which one does one follow? How how does how does one go about it? Well, if you ask Saint Kabir, he says Guru Govind are both of them. Ka ko lagu pa? Guru and Govind both of them are standing before me. Who should I first prostrate? He says, "Ali Hari Guru Aap ki Govind diyo dikha hai." So I think that Guru is more important than Govind. But ultimately, Govind is important because Guru is a, is a, is a link to uh, to reaching Govind. And how many gurus? Like, guru is not see every every sannyasi is not a guru. Is it is a personal relationship. And so, a Swami is not a guru. Once upon a time, a Uh, a journalist asked our Swami Ji, "Are you a guru?" Because when he first came to United States, so here "guru" became a word in English dictionary, also an accepted word. So, are you a guru? He says, "I am a Swami. I am a sadhu. I am guru to my disciple. I am not a universal guru. Father is to own, you know, children." father is not a general universal name god can be called universal father and god can be called universal guru but nobody is universal guru guru only with reference to it's a relative name with reference to a disciple so who should you look upon guru whatever in your heart creates this feeling of reverence for somebody you can look upon that person as a guru <coughs> But it's not that, and we can listen to number of people. We can learn from them, but they all need not be our gurus. So we keep our eyes and mind open and learn from where are which our sources. Guru hopefully should be one, not two men, because guru is has a place in our heart. And there are too we cannot be too many people in our heart, one heart. So, but. You could have more than one guru. Not he cannot have. The Tathagata claims to have twenty-four gurus. You know, so anybody from whom he learned is his guru. That's how he said. But guru is a personal relationship, and that bond automatically comes in course of time. The problem is that you feel reverence to many, many gurus. That is good. The reverence for many gurus. Learn from all of them. Learn from them all. If you have more than one guru, nothing wrong in it. As long as it does not create a conflict. You see, sometimes what happens is different. Uh, uh, Swamis have different styles and different way of communication. Sometimes their views also may differ, and so therefore, uh, having more than one guru can create conflict in us. As long as God is not created, so long you are fine. Swami ji, there are different kind of people in this room only. We have so many different souls. Now, soul A is happy. It's very happy in all circumstances. Soul B is not. And soul B tends to find things to be miserable, things which are not. Giving pleasure or which are not causing happiness to me. My question to you is: This state of happiness and unhappiness is it caused by our karma? Is it predestined, or can we change it? What karma creates are the situations. Happiness and unhappiness are our responses to situations that belong to us. Karma creates the situations. But whether this situation creates in me happiness or unhappiness depends upon me. And never, uh, more you grow within yourself in terms of the purity of your heart, more likely you are to be happy. And less you grow in your heart, less likely you are to be happy. A given situation can make somebody happy. 
same thing can make somebody else unhappy. That doesn't depend upon the situation, depends upon the person. It is like this, that you may like a rose and somebody may like, uh, you know, some other flower, lotus and whatever. And so responses are different. However, in this case, whether a person is happy or unhappy depends upon the emotional maturity to which the person has evolved. Happiness is a function of evolution. To what extent you are emotionally mature. So karma has no role in it. Karma has no role. Your effort has a role. That's where Purusha becomes. So we'll take last two questions. Mm. Last two questions and then we'll have prasad and then go up and have some more prasad upstairs. Swami, <laughs> uh, a question about meditation. It's, it's, for me, how can I improve my concentration to be in that uh, mode? It's, it gets very really tough. Like after like five minutes, it's very really tough for me. It's tough for everybody. Mind me, what it is, it is difficult to concentrate the mind. But the object of meditation, more devotion and love you have for that, more is likely that your mind will be concentrated. So for meditation, choose a form of deity or choose a name for which you will love or work to cultivate that love. Suppose you want to meditate on Lord Krishna, then expose yourself to the listening of the stories of Lord Krishna, his glories. And more you listen to that, more power or devotion will be created. And it's devotion that makes possible the meditation. That's a binding factor. What binds me the object of meditation is devotion. So, Swami, uh, the last question. question. <laughs> Please. I'm sorry. I have a question about um, how you said uh, karma is our situation, how we respond <clears throat> to our situation, whether we're unhappy or happy. But how do you control, not control, but how do you deal with your reactions when you can't, you, you choose the wrong reaction, but then you regret the wrong reaction? So how do you deal? Because I think it's internal anger of yourself. You get angry with your own responses. So you're like, why did I do that? I should have, I should have done it differently. So it's self, self, you know, loathing actually that starts. That's what I think creates my unhappiness. Yes, there are what we call these impulses in our mind. They are broadly classified as Raga and Dvesha, attachment and aversion. So we have in our mind anger, resentment, jealousy, frustration. These things are there. And whenever a situation pushes a button, that reaction automatically emerges in our mind and takes a hold of our mind. It is that impulse that decides what we do. We are not doing it. It's my anger or my jealousy or something that actually decides what I say and what I, the, the way I behave. And later on when the, uh, the force of the impulse subsides, then I come to my true sense and I realize that what I did was wrong. But you did not do that. Your anger had done it. Your jealousy had done it. That impulse had done it. That time, we are not in control of our mind. The mind is controlled by that impulse. So, what we can do is this. Is to learn from every such situation. Suppose you did something out of impulse. You said something. Which you later on regret. Okay. Then ask yourself, why did that impulse come? Why did I get angry? Why did I, why was I resentful? Why was I, was I frustrated? Whatever that reaction was, why did it come? You'll find a reason. Usually some expectation is a reason. Anger is a reason, is the result of a failed expectation. So there are many expectations in our mind. Expectations from other people, 
expectations from different situations. More expectations we have, more likely we are to get angry. And so, whenever the impulse of anger subsides, then you come to your own senses and ask, why did I become angry? Why was I jealous? Why, why did that reaction come? Understand those and try to work with them. Yeah. If comparing yourself with somebody caused jealousy and you could not stand the progress made by somebody else, that's jealousy. Ask yourself, can I congratulate that person? Can I join in the happiness of that person? So rather than being jealous, can I join the accomplishment of that person? Can I join the enjoyment of that person? So for every kind of an impulse, there is what we call Pratipaksha Bhavana or an opposite Bhavana. An opposite standpoint is always there. Anger comes when my expectation has failed. So I can ask, can I drop the expectation? Then there's one less occasion for anger. So thus for every impulse, there is a reason. Understand that. Or seek somebody's help, you know, to understand. And once you understand why a given impulse has arisen, you can work on it and try to eliminate that from the mind. And that way we can slowly and slowly overcome our impulses. Okay, good. Just last Yes, one. absolutely. Uh, how do we deal with other people's disappointment? So when we are disappointing others, how do we respond to that and you know, failing to visit, you know, our parents in law and all those things, how do we, how should we respond to it? Well, when somebody is disappointed on our account, that's not our problem. It's their problem because their expectation from us. But what happens is when they are near and dear ones to us, there is sort of an emotional blackmail kind of a thing, you know. <laughs> that by being disappointed, they in a way are trying to control you. That what you are doing is not right and do it differently. And therefore, uh, first of all, create a distance. Understand that it is their disappointment, not your disappointment. It is their expectation, not your expectation. Then ask further, is their expectation fair? What parents or any near and dear ones expect out of us? Is it a reasonable expectation? Is it a fair expectation? If that is so, then I will strive to fulfill their expectation. It's not a fair, very, very often, it is not a fair or reasonable expectation also. In which case, you have to leave them to them because you can't help it. You can do what you can do. You can have a commitment to try to do better than you are doing. But still there is going to be a limitation. And what is expected out of you goes beyond your limitation. There is nothing you can do. Somebody says, your skin must be fairer than what you are. What can you do about that? <laughs> the nose will be from what if there is something you can't help. Similarly, I have certain capabilities and I can accomplish with reference to those capabilities. And I can always try to improve my capabilities so that my performance improves. But that can't happen overnight. If somebody expects me that I should perform much better than what I am doing, I need not feel obliged to fulfill that expectation. I do not feel guilty. They make you feel guilty. By being disappointed from you, they make you feel guilty. There is something wrong with you. There is some lack in you. Because of which, so that disappointment is justified. And there is a lack in you which is not justified, you know. So understand this whole phenomenon, all this mechanism of how the mind works. And then tell yourself that you have done the best you could do. And you are committed to doing the best. You can't do better than best. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamivavashish
Shabbat